stream would be looking at my shoulder and I'm very insecure about my shoulder. So that's, uh, that's not, not great. So cool. Uh, thank you very much. And let's now get this started and let's invite the prime minister to open this debate. Here, here. Thank you. Uh, can I get a quick wee mic check? Yeah, I, I hear you. Smashing. Speech starting in three, two, one. Status quo, China is able to construct upstream hydroelectric dams that flood Tibet with no specific regards for any consequences to anyone out with its state. Uzbekistan, to meet the specific unsustainable demands of its cotton industry, are able to completely drain the Aral Sea, which I am told by Keris is now one third of its original size, just because the specific water resources are now beholden to the other incentives that these states have. Water as a resource had ramifications beyond the single parameters of any one state or the parameters of our own lifetime. We cannot leave the management of these resources up to chance at the point that they will always be subject to the effects of other incentives and the fact that they will always be ecologically mismanaged due to the lack of expertise within the specific situations that this occurs in. We think of the point that we are able to construct an international body that specifically looks towards the long term, can apply expertise that will specifically result in no, this mismanagement no longer occurring and will result in these states that get fucked over by the status quo asymmetry no longer getting flooded. We think this is specifically the point when we stand over these resources that probably look like things like water sources, irrigation and hydroelectric power now being protected by what, let's just call it the fucking UN Water Council or something. I think then at the point this is true, I'm going to do two things in this speech. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to explain what these international bodies do and why we get comparative degrees of accountability regarding the management of water resources. Secondly, I'm going to broadly impact this in terms of how water resources are getting exploited to a manner which is unsustainable. What do these international bodies look like? I think there is a comparative degree of accountability to this international body for a couple of reasons. One, at the point that it is consisted of, uh, I'll take the clarification in a second, at the point that it consists of a multitude of states, there is likely internal voting mechanisms and pressures that can be applied to it. Secondarily, it often looks like your capacity to inflict things like sanctions on those who end up no longer obeying the specific rules of the Water Council. We think at the point where you are able to mitigate the asymmetry by individual states being able to form blocks within this council rather than just being subject to their tyrannical neighbours who are always going to flood them in order to specifically pursue their own incentives with this management of the water resources. We think this specifically the point where we mitigate this power asymmetry. Closing, I'll take the clarification. Can you give us a broad characterization of what the decision-making processes in this international body will look like? Sure. So I think the decision making process is probably just looks like some degree of a vote. I think it's probably a sort of like, let's say it's a 66% majority. I think that's probably something we're reasonably happy to stand over in so far as it prevents some degree of this asymmetry that exists within the status quo. I think that's fairly intuitive. What are the incentives then of a specific international body? A couple of things. I think it at the point it is specifically applied within an international lens. I think it is incentivized to provide both an equal and a stable act access to water. Specifically on the comparative, at the point that states are able to manage their own water supplies, and generally these are things which exist on state uh, passing through a multitude of state borders, you are unable to necessarily get equal and stable access to it at the point that one state is able to monopolize the way that they access it with no regard for other states. Secondarily, I think you have specific incentives to institute environmental protections at the point that this is your only incentive and you are not beholden to other incentives like state specific specifically are at the point that they try and utilize their water resources. Thirdly, I think you are able to engage in technological exchanges. I think this is crucial in examples like the Uzbekistan one I gave earlier, which is specifically resulting in a depletion of its water supply due to its lack of irrigation expertise. At the point that you engage in this exchange, this is when you are able to mitigate these information asymmetries across states. Fourthly, and I think this is very important, you specifically are beholden to the greater good at the point that you are an international body. Your incentives are 
are unable to be short term and they are unable to specifically favor one state and so far as your voting mechanism necessarily means that your legitimacy is garnered from the entirety of the membership rather than the specific power of one. Because note at the point that you are able to form a block within these states alongside other ones who are necessarily going to be disaligned with your neighbors who are status quo flooding the fuck out of you. This is the point when you are able to mitigate the asymmetry that is currently present status quo and this is when nations like China stop being able to bully people with their access to water. What are the impacts then of this? I think there's broadly a couple of ways in which this plays out. I think first of all at the point when you construct institutions like upstream hydroelectric dams this results in the flooding of places like Tibet, like India due to nothing but the fact that they are stuck there with geographical proximity and little power. I think this looks like specific communities with no political capital being flooded and no amount of international pressure being sufficient at the point that there is no specific body that is able to regulate the management of this. Secondly, I think it, due to lack of expertise, I think this looks like specifically poor ecological planning at the point that you are probably doing more comparatively unsustainable things due to your beholden nature to other incentives and your lack of expertise. Thirdly, note that at the point that water is a resource for a multitude of things, you necessarily always have to make value judgments on what you are using that water for. That is to say that at the point it's always aligning with your other incentives, be that in terms of your productivity and industry, you are always going to have to try and like reconcile what you are using that water for at any one time. Due to the specific nature of states and having to get elected in the short term and having to appeal beneficial in that way, they are always going to misuse this water structurally to try and boost as much productivity as possible, rather than with specific care for the long-term sustainability of it. We think at the point that the management shifts to something with an environmental lens rather than something with an economical lens, this is specifically the point where we are able to garner that stability. But what are the incentives beyond this for why this gets done? I think there are all also political reasons for why states specifically do this. No China are able to specifically bully other states and create political tensions at the point that they are able to do these big showy dams that flood parts of the community and signal to them, look how much bigger we are than you. I think at the point that these result in massive amounts of tensions and specifically geographically pro, uh, close areas, this is the point where an international body is specifically obliged to step in to prevent these tensions escalating further. I think note also at the point that you are using this unsustainably to meet these short-term profit incentives, I think this is specifically when you are unable to access this in the future. At the point that Uzbekistan could have its cotton industry managed more sustainably by this water council, this is the point when you would be able to access it to a comparative degree now, but also in the future and so far as water is a resource that we will always have. I think you lose arable land and access to water because note here, Water is a prerequisite for every other action and like resource that we end up taking. And so far as this is this prerequisite, we cannot leave it up to an individual state when the parameters of its effect stem so far beyond borders, never been prouder to propose. Thank you very much for that speech. Uh, now I'm very happy to welcome the... Thank you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for that speech. Now I'm very happy to move on to the Deputy Prime Minister. Woo. Just a quick mic check there. Can people hear me? Yeah. Okie dokie. I'd like to start off this speech firstly by saying that OO's comparative harm is literally the status quo, which is a situation in which smaller states can have their water resources exploited by larger states. This already happens as per Jason's analysis. What we uniquely do is give them at least slightly and like marginally more leverage to fight back against these larger countries. Uh, but I'd also like to just engage in a little bit of uh, further rebuttal, which is basically, I think even if all of what we heard from OO about it not being enforceable were true, we still get things like technological exchange, which prevents really inefficient like irrigation systems, for instance. And even if the leverage is only applied to smaller states, we can, we can at least make them use their own water supply sustainably. See our Uzbekistan example, in which they literally just fucked themselves over in the long term because they had extremely short term thinking about the sustainability of their water system. 
I think what we have here is an accountability mechanism that works in at least some situations. And we also have an OO case competing here, which has literally no comparative harm. I think also this, lastly, this thing about water wars, I think this literally only applies in states where there's already a fairly delicate balance between powers. And I think this also internally prevents misuse of it within like one state, which structurally occurs due to water being like forced to meet demands of other incentives. And also because politically unstable states are likely not to engage in a lot of long-term thinking. Okay, but how will I, what will I do in this speech now? I'm gonna firstly rebuild some of Jason's mechanisms for why this is actually probably still going to help to hold larger states to account. And then I'm gonna flesh out some of the impacts as to why water and access to water is so important and why even if we can prove a small comparative extra bit of leverage, we can still win this debate. Okay, so there's two main mechanisms that we talked about that went unresponded to pretty much. The first is collective bargaining. I think you're able to just band together as a block uh, if, you're, if you're a bunch of smaller states that are being exploited by a larger state that's perhaps upstream from you. I think you have increased leverage against these kinds of countries. You're able to like at least extract concessions. So I think what this looks like is even if, as they say, the power is still asymmetric, we reduce this asymmetry. So if China wants to fuck over all of Southeast Asia by putting a bunch of hydroelectric power dams uh, and like flooding some areas and like um, making some areas e experience drought, the least these countries can do is say, oh, can we have some access to this hydroelectric power? They can ask for at least some marginal concessions. I think then secondly, you get the assistance of larger powers. Now this is our main, the main reason why we still can influence uh, large actors like China. So larger powers are always looking to at least fuck over their competing, their other competing powers, and also secondly, expand their soft power influence to regions outside their immediate sphere of influence. I think this manifests as a desire to support disputes leveled by small countries, by larger actors, to both undermine their larger competing powers and also assert soft power over smaller nations. I think in practice, this looks like the US probably wanting to support South Asia, uh, Asian nations who level disputes against China because they want to undermine China's power in the region and undermine their regional hegemony. I think the conclusion here is we still have greater negotiating power on, of nations on our side to prevent exploitation. I think we probably still can ex, ex, uh, have some leverage over larger powers. Okay, what key problems does this solve? Firstly, we have the upstream downstream asymmetry problem. I think when I'm upstream of a river that flows down to other nat nations, I currently in the status quo have supreme capacity to exploit my position to construct dams, HEP st stations, and like fodder my irrigation systems as much as I please. I think all of this can be done with no regard to how this ne negatively impacts my downstream neighbors. It looks like China fucking over Southeast Asia and also regions of North India uh, experience giving them like droughts and uh, also flooding some regions at the same time because they're constructing a bunch of dams in Tibet, which is where the water sources for a lot of these nations are. I think what changes on our side is is especially egregious actions are likely going to result in penalties to discourage these things happening. These are going to be like fines and sanctions. I think we also then have increased leverage for smaller states to prevent huge abuses at least, or at least extract some concessions when abuses occur. Like, so if, if China wants to use HEP to fuck us over, the least they could do is provide us with some of this hydroelectric power. I think what happens is we kind of spread out the benefits of water supply at least a little bit more, and we get less egregious abuses. I think we also then have less overwhelming soft power of upstream states to supremely threaten their neighbors with bad practices. So like China basically has supreme control over um, over countries like Cambodia. And part of the reason why they have that control is because they can completely cut off their access to food if they were because they control their water supply. Um, I think I think this gives countries like makes them less susceptible to this kind of foreign influence, probably also gives them more negotiating power in other related matters because they're not co constantly being threatened. I think the second thing we we importantly do is I think in countries where there's a lack of expertise and there's short term thinking, which leads to crisis, uh, I think because th th there's an incentive to like sometimes engage in these unsustainable practices, because some countries firstly just lack the technology to implement sustainable irrigation systems. And they also, if they have a p an unstable political system, they're incentivized to engage in ecological mismanagement and over exploitation, because there's not really anyone holding, um, holding these practices to account within the state internally. I think what this looks like is you're screwing over your neighbors, but crucially, you're also screwing over yourself in the long term. How we fix this is I think we're able to collaborate and provide technology and expertise to make irrigation systems more efficient worldwide and also predict and prevent mismanagement because we have all of this expertise. But before I move on, I'll take closing. Okay. Opening. Okay. Yeah. Opening.
Uh, no closing. Yeah, that's fine. Quickly. Anyone? Go. <laughs> Why do states at all comply with any of these things? Like, how do you get a cohesive unified vote when water is geographically bounded and these states have interests far, far apart? Just no one will follow this if America tries to intervene in China's Okay, so I think I think currently what you're kind of lacking is the fact that we've already provided you three mechanisms for how this takes place. China doesn't want like um, a bunch of Western countries in like Europe or whatever to put a shit ton of sanctions on them because they rely on consumer economies to like make money and, and keep their country afloat. I, again, this is so unresponsive. Okay, I think what we do here is we, we probably like get some compliance from these kind of countries that are engaging in mismanagement at the point at which we're providing with the technology, but also we're pretty much willing to force them to uh, in implement these things anyway, because it's better for them in the long term. I think what this looks like is we've got more efficiency and less waste of water supplies. We prevent ecological disasters that harm countries long term, like the Aral Sea disaster, which not only fucked over Uzbekistan internally, but also fucked their neighbors. And even though they implemented it to improve their cotton industry, it made their land less arable in the long term, which kind of like undermined their incentives in the first place. I think we also probably dampen inter uh, international tension so like india's not getting fucked by china anymore it's not flooding i think we decrease tension we reduce exploitation all of these reasons how to propose thank you very much for that speech now i'm very happy to move on to the deputy leader of the opposition here here hi i'm here yeah brilliant Just give me two seconds Okay, three, two, one. Panel, just because there's an organization called the World Trade Organization doesn't mean that world trade happens completely equally, completely fairly. What open and government have missed is that international organizations always reflect the underlying power structures between the countries that are in them. What did Kibi tell you? We told you firstly that the most powerful countries are unlikely to respond in any meaningful capacity to the sanctions and the incentives that are created by the body, meaning that you don't resolve any of the problems open government are trying to talk about you. But secondly, and this is where we get the construction harm that everyone seems to have ignored. Smaller countries who are harmed by the sanctions and who need the water trade to be able to plan their economies are going to get unimaginably screwed over by this organization. Firstly, on efficacy, going through specifically why none of their mechanisms are likely to work in the reality of international relations. And then on smaller countries that need the water trade and how this harms them. What do they tell you about how it's going to work? They say, ah, we have a voting mechanism and we have sanctions. I think he even explained to you in a lot of detail why powerful countries still have a huge amount of power within these bodies, but I just want to go through it incredibly specifically. First thing, the incredible, the, the large powers always have the capacity to ignore the sanctions because a sanction with only a small amount of a country's economy, if you have a very large economy, you're better able to withstand that. I mean, China is being sanctioned to fuck right now, but it's still doing all of the things that it wanted to do originally. The reason for that is because it has incentives to do so. They try and characterize these countries as must mustache twirling villains, they're just like flooding faces. The reason that they do things like that is because it is economically viable to them to export order to countries that are around them or to use the land that is existing. All of those things still have an impact on their economy. The sanctions would have to be substantially larger than that impact that is having on the economy, given that these are already things that provoke international national disagreement, it is likely that that has a lot of meaning to their economy, so I don't know why they respond to it. Secondly, no, the, the, the countries always have the power to leave because you can't force someone to stay in an international organization. And specifically, the biggest powers have a huge amount of bargaining potential in that regard. Two reasons for this. Firstly, the 60% of the world's water trade goes through Russia, China, and America. The biggest powers need to be in the union to actually be able to move water and affect the water trade. Secondly, an international organization only has significant legitimacy at the point at which larger countries are seen to be engaging with it and you get that kind of diplomacy. What does this mean? It means that these powers have a huge amount of bargaining potential when it comes to how the union is operated. This looks like them being able to stop things that don't suit their interests even getting put on the table in the first place. So even if 60% of people would be able to vote for it, that never happens prima facie so you don't actually get that engagement. Thirdly, note that all of the power relations that they talk about existing between these countries continue to exist just because they're in a union with other countries doesn't mean they don't engage them externally to it. So they can still use bullying tactics or put pressure on other countries to vote in their favor, even in the absolute ideal world where they're in the union and you get some kind of bid to stop China from flooding its dams. It just uses all of the same power mechanisms, all of the same trade incentives that it has to like withhold trade from other countries, put in form of sanctions on them, things like that. 
This means that all of these countries have no incentive to actually engage with this, but these smaller countries for whom sanctions actually do make a very big deal to their economy have to listen to what is happening and lose the crucial control they had over their economy. They say, ah, people will form trade blocks and this will give them a huge amount of power. Firstly, if they are close to other countries with water under status quo and they haven't formed a trade block already, I don't understand why they would do it now, given that presumably in the real world they already have that incentive. But secondly, note that any trade block will still be dominated by the most powerful country within that trade block for all of the same mechanisms that I've already explained all the same capacity to still put pressure on them. I don't understand how you get any meaningful change. And at the point at which that is true, I don't see any of the changes to the world order economy actually happening, except for the harmful ones that Keevan explained to you, and I'll go into more detail on them then. Then they say you're going to get expertise and environmental stuff, and you'll do irrigation and those kind of things. Firstly, you know, the countries would have to consent into this being how the organization works. Given that under status quo, they defer to their short-term interest to make money from the water trade or use it for geopolitical reasons. I don't understand why suddenly their incentives change to want water to be used in a uh, environmentally friendly capacity. But secondly, even if experts, uh, they can see to all this and they allow experts to get, get involved, there's huge disagreement among experts about how you solve any of these problems. They didn't give you any mechanism for resolving this. What I think is most likely is that the experts that agree with the major powers in the world who have structural power within the union are the ones who set the terms. Thirdly, note that even if you get this agreement and even if you get a perfect capacity to solve these environmental problems, the countries themselves are then have to adopt all of those policies. As Kevin explains to you, they don't have an army. They can't go in and make people change their irrigation procedures or spend a huge amount of their tax money on these things. I don't understand how that necessarily happens. But finally, even if they get all of this, I am just willing to trade this off for the harms that are going to happen to smaller countries. Because realistically, the environment and the water trade is probably fucked anyway in the long term. The, any changes that they get would likely be a marginal capacity to reduce the scale of future water wars or things like that. That might happen. The harm to a country no longer having control of its water trade at the point when it actually needs to use it as bargaining power over the people around to it has a huge human cost to individuals in that country. I think that's more important within the debate. How does this affect smaller countries? Firstly, they need to be able to use water as a bargaining tool because the reason why they use hike prices to neighbors isn't because they just want to annoy them because that would be a really bad idea to do to people who are your neighbors. So you do it because they have incentives to try and extract concessions on other things. What this means is Kyrgyzstan using the fact that it has control of the water supply to stop Kazakhstan from hiking the price of electricity, but there's still cheap electricity in the country. At the point at which you cede power from the individual country to have control over its water supply, you're much more likely to get unfair deals organized with those other countries, but also, crucially, you reduce the perception in people in Kazakhstan that Kyrgyzstan has control over the water. So that soft bargaining ship that exists between the diplomatic policymakers no longer exists, which is hugely harmful to them. Two more mechanisms that I'll get onto, but firstly, closing, you have a POI. Yeah, so just uh, like a numbers check, the majority of countries are downstream from water sources because water sources flow through many countries. So the way your case is countries who have the water source can fuck over other countries. You're fucking over countries more than you help them. But the reason that they do that isn't because they're evil. The reason they do that is to extract concessions on other things that are important to them. At the point at which different people have control over different things, you get an iterated prisoner's dilemma and how they engage. This is literally basic IOR theory. Secondly, note that countries that only have water as their main export have based all the long-term projections of their economy on the fact that they will be exporting water. The point at which you change that and you take that capacity away from them, that is a huge economic shock to those individuals. Finally, note that you give a huge amount of capacity for larger countries to pervert the way that the water trade works in their favor. What this means is that if Russia wants to extract cotton from Kyrgyzstan, say, it can now try and apply sanctions on it through the water union, because water is incredibly important for Kyrgyzstan, but it's not currently exporting that to Russia. So you give a huge amount of capacity for countries to act with impunity towards people who aren't even their neighbor, further fucking over those, those, those countries, further increasing the depth of the harm to those individuals. Some countries really need water, but do not have the power to protect their economy. They get destroyed by this policy. Other countries have water and a huge amount of other power. They get to use this union for their own ends, for their own impunity. Nothing else changes. Only those problems happen. This union simply will not work. It's an incredibly bad idea, desperately proud to oppose. Thank you very much for that speech. Now I'm very happy to move this debate to the bottom half and invite the member of government here, here. Okay, uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Amazing, okay, just give me five seconds to lay out my paper in that case. <laughs> 
Um, in that case, I will start in three, two, one, go. Two extensions in this speech. Firstly, on effectiveness. And the way we're going to win this is look at individual politicians and their incentives and why international bodies like the UN sometimes do work in the first place. We're going to give four new distinct reasons for that. And then secondly, we're going to look at collective action problems and corporate capture and why we help resolve those issues as well. Before that, a couple of points of direct rebuttal. Um, the first, uh, a lot of the old case, unfortunately, is simply mitigation against the government side. But let's respond to a couple of things. Firstly, they say that you can make, um, that bigger countries will still bully smaller ones in, in this kind of new body, and therefore we won't be effective in getting the right outcomes. I think the response to this is just to say it's uncomparative, right? Probably what happens on their side is this huge country approaches on a one-to-one -one basis, a very small country over which it has a lot of strings attached, over which it has a lot of leverage, and says, hey, I want you to give me this deal right now, um, otherwise, you know, your water's getting cut off or something like that, right? Um, I think the, if the comparative is that they have to, like, uh, this big country has to face off against a whole block of countries, I think they're much less able um, to do that than when there's a huge power imbalance. So, like, pretty common sense response um, to that. Okay, and the other thing they say is, uh, well, for a lot of countries, it's very important to be able to export um, their water. Um, and then a response to this is like, yes, but more like every country needs to consume water, but only a tiny number of countries in the world are able to export water as a resource uh, and to be lucky enough to have like that singular source as we point out in a POI. So probably their impacts don't land for that many countries. But even if they do care about those countries, we give them a forum from which to extract concessions via arbitration and exchange. And um, that's what we get on our side. Okay, first event on a Effectiveness. I think OG have a very kind of like, you know, brute force sledgehammer approach to enforcing this, right? They talk about sanctions or like some kind of intervention into these countries. We're going to give you more nuanced political incentives as to why this is likely to hold up in the first place and why we're likely to get legitimate by it. I think there's four reasons for this. The first is exchange and arbitration. Under the status quo, say I'm like a big country like Tajikistan, I have a lot, a lot of water flowing through me, and I have very little incentive to share that water because I want as much of it for my um, power dam as possible. What happens now under this side is you, uh, under our motion, is we give them like a forum in the UN to discuss and arbitrate with other countries how best they can uh, all make the most out of that water, right? What this is likely to look like is, for example, Tajikistan makes a proposition like, okay, I will still use a lot of my water, but I'm willing to sell some of it um, in exchange for this other political concession or in exchange for like more foreign investment to my country or something like that, right? So there's a direct benefit to countries, maybe not in always entering every single deal, but at least in being involved in the forum in which those kind, that kind of arbitration can take place and they can you know, sell, their, uh, sell their resources for the most benefit possible. So there's an incentive for countries to buy into this forum and be a part of this body under our side. Um, the second reason it's likely to be effective is diplomatic climate. I think the, the thing with this body is you never know when you're going to need it, right? Maybe there's some kind of water crisis upstream to you quite soon, and therefore you really wish you were part of that body and you could be involved in these kinds of discussions. Um, uh, and therefore, even if a country right now doesn't necessarily care about the water situation or want to change it at all, it's likely to still want to stay a member um, in case it needs it in the future, but also because it can trade its vote in other wa water disputes um, for like other political concessions from other countries. So it wants to stay a member to have that vote, to have that say at the negotiating table, and to have that diplomatic part. Second reason why countries will want to buy into this. Um, the third reason is because it's tied to the UN itself. I think OG have like a super legitimate definition that they're going to make this a part of the UN. Therefore, it's possible to presume that you can't really leave this body on its own without also leaving a lot of the other UN bodies as well that this is tied to. To the extent that countries want to stay a member of the Security Council and stay a member of the General Assembly, I think they'd quite like to stay a part of this UN body as well because it's tied to participation in these other activities too. The fourth reason why we're likely to get buy-in and effectiveness is the incentives of individual politicians. And this is really important. And that's a, a much needed nuance over top half. Say that you're a big time leader in your, in your country, you're a big country, you have a lot of water, and you're bullying all the smaller countries downstream from you. You already have lots of recognition within your country because you're the leader. But what you really crave is recognition on the international stage. Under opposition side, the way you get recognition is doing grandstanding. This is our water. We're not giving it away for anything. It's the natural birthright of our people. What happens now when you give them a forum to speak at the UN, when you invite them on television, when you get them to shake hands with Obama and the general secretary of the UN? 
that's when you uh, that's when they want to get that recognition and in order to get the best type of recognition possible that's when they're willing to make some kind of concessions in order to have that statesman-like image so when you give a forum for politicians to seem statesman-like um that's when you get them to start to make concessions whereas in opposition it, these politicians just grandstand in domestic politics uh, and don't have the, that, that pressure put on them by the international community so that's the fourth reason why nations are likely to want to buy into this it's because of the individual need and desire and thirst for international recognition from the, their political leaders. So four reasons why we're likely to get affected by it on our side. Before I go on to my second point, I'll take a POI from closing opposition. Okay, so the issue with the whole port bench is that the nations get to vote and that the same reverse incentive applies. Obviously, you are still going to grandstand, grandstand on the international stage, like every, religious, every leader does, because that's the way you get the support of your own people. Um, so I think these people, um, the thing is that it looks worse if you're doing it at the UN because the UN is specifically a forum for concessions dialogue. At the point where all the other leaders are condemning you at the UN, that's not an image you want to have, right? If you if you get them to a forum where like the way to look good in this forum is to make concessions and is to appear statement like, and that's the metric for success at the UN, that's when you uh, they're more likely to appear concessions. The metric for success for the domestic politics on your side is much more likely to be grandstanding. Okay, second point on the race to uh, race to the bottom. Um, in terms of regulations and why that's a really big impact. So I think OG say uh, about short term and long term incentives, but um, uh, I think like what, what we really want to talk about is the collective action problem, right? Which is like completely different. Um, I think what happens um, on our, uh, okay, what happens to the status quo is this happens to lots of smaller countries in South America, lots of smaller countries in Africa, for example. What happens is a company goes to a country and says, I want you to abolish environmental regulations or me building this factory next to this river right now, or me using this water in my production processes in this way. And if the country says, no, we don't, uh, we don't want to abolish these regulations, they start to just move that factory to the neighboring country instead. Right, so there's a race to the bottom in terms of regulations. This has huge impacts because it means that in the long term, it's very unsustainable economically for these countries because they're, the river gets screwed over and they can't make money from it in the future. And secondly, it's really bad for the local environment. The unique change on our side is countries can band together to form these regulations and the companies can no longer start to leave and go to the neighboring country if it's also part of the same UN body and therefore subject to the same regulations. So the big multinational companies can no longer borrow for, um, really small individual um, like developing nations in, in order to um, force a race to the bottom, right? And the other reason we fix this is corporate capture. I think it's very easy for um, like a multinational company to um, to lobby politicians of a small individual nation to lower its regulations. But if it's like a huge international body, they have to lobby like 60 different states in order to get the same effect of reducing regulations. Where, um, so uh, for those two reasons, under our side, we get a much lower race to the bottom in terms of regulations, which may, means for um, more sustainable growth um, for these countries. So it's because we uniquely prove effectiveness on our side. And secondly, because we reduce the race to the bottom, we're proud to stand in closing government. Thank you very much for that speech. I'm very happy to now move on to the member of opposition here, here. All right, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Cool. Panel, so far I think this has been a super generic debate about whether international organizations are good. Porbin solved Luke, we solve collective effort, active problems. O says Luke, individual nations solve leverage. What we are going to do, we are going to show be the real Dutchies and talk about specifics of water management and explain why they are better. I'm going to start with one general point of rebuttal. Then I'm actually the first team to going to give you the comparative why I think the status quo works all right -ish. Then I'm going to talk about what this organization looks like and I'm going to impact into four different ways of why this policy will cost life. The one point of rebuttal already hinted at in the POI, I think the whole issue with both opening and closing government is that the logic is, look, nations have perverse incentives. Then they say, look, we're going to get an international body where those nations get to vote. And then they think all those incentives magically change or disappear. But they never analyze why. I think this body is going to be short term because every constituent wants its leader to vote short term. I think people are going to grandstand and not agree because the citizens wanted to grandstand and not give in. So literally all the harms are symmetric unless they explain, explain why people start voting differently the moment they become part of the international body. And notice that it's empirically false when we look at the UN. You do precisely what you expect countries to do because they know that their voters at home arching. The rest of the battle will be interwoven. One well, I want to be very clear about the comparative. Look, the crucial thing about water, as everyone can see, uh, agrees with one, is that it's necessary that you literally can't go without. What happens when one country like screws over the water supply of the other country is that the screwing over country, say China, has already a basic account of water because that's where the river originates, whereas the other country is completely dependent on them. 
Because the other country has no alternative, you can know that the moment you screw them over too much, they're going to do literally everything in their possibility to make sure you not do that. We're literally talking about war. We're talking about putting every kind of money against it. The trade-off then is simple. We already have some water. You would like some extra electricity, but then you need to engage in the war with Vietnam. So China would eventually win that war, but that war would cost them an insane amount of money. It's then easier to say, okay, we'll get a different source of energy, then go engage into that war. So because the cost of the power asymmetry, you have a thing that looks like mutually assured destruction, but the moment you start screwing over a nation too much, the costs for you are simply way higher than the benefits. You lose it on their side of the house, given the fact that water management, therefore screwing you over, is no longer simply done by you as a nation, but been done by the whole international body. That means Vietnam can no longer threat the war to China, but needs to threat the war to the whole international organization that directly implemented this means you no longer have to leverage we think that means things get significantly worse and the kind of extortion get worse what is the organization going to look like two for specific for specific things about water one it's highly regional and it means that a large amount of nations simply do not care what happens in china for example all african nations are unlikely to care at all i think the second big impact is that it's very important to know what it actually affects you, but it's quite rare to happen because the biggest amount of disputes are in parts of the earth you don't have anything to do with. What does that mean? The one means that you're going to use all the power you have, the soft power and the hard power you have over countries, to make sure they vote in a specific way. Notice here the first time that big nations are likely to have more sway and are bigger part of the nations. I think they are part of the debate. Basically, we call sport bench analysis five, but also because I think that's more within the scope of the motion. We're going to take proposition at the best and say those large nations are going to be a part of it. So the large nations have more of the soft power and can therefore do a bigger job of swaying people by cutting off development aid, by threatening with trade barriers, et cetera, et cetera. The second big part is that you directly need voting blocks, as OG directly considers. The point is that the voting blocks are going to be dominated by the big powers because I've already seen they are so powerful. There are two more crucial points of context here. The first is that you have direct competition between those voting blocks. And the moment you become the best voting block is by being more extreme and more radical than the other, basically going further to prevent them. The second one is that no nation wants to be in a voting block with their direct competitor, given the fact that the voting block doesn't want them because they can no longer vote that way, but also that you don't want to be associated with the power and doesn't want to have to vote the same way. What does that mean that this is going to look like? It means you have two to three power blocks, which is dominated and pretty much dividing anything, basically pretty much like the UN looked in the Cold War. What are the impacts of this? One, this means this body is becoming completely ineffective. Notice that OG puts a threshold of 66%. I think you're completely unlikely to ever reach that threshold. Why is that specifically here issue? Notice that in cases of water management, you need to act quick. There can be a drought, there can be a flood. All of that directly needs to be dealt with in the short term. If you do all the lobbying and voting and you get to a stalemate, people are literally dying on a daily basis. You have then the incentive to wait and to push because there's always one side more affected by dying than the other side. It means you have a perverse incentive which literally leads to people dying. The second part is that big nations get significantly more leverage over smaller nations. Why? Because you need them the moment you get the vote, you need the US to lead the voting block in your way. What does that mean? That means they can extort them even more when it comes to trading, because you guarantee their vote and they decide who votes for you because they control the voting block. That means all kinds of repression. You can be used to be forced into military nations. I think that's back for utilitarian reason, but I also think like sovereignty, autonomy, etc. You don't want a couple of nations having full say over other countries. You do it by creating the voting block around them. What's the consequence here? The US will always be powerful, but at the other way of screwing a developing nation over has a cost to them. At the moment you cut off trade, you are harmed yourself. At the moment you engage into military action, that it costs them. Here, the only thing you need to do is decide on the voting block that you literally got for free. It means that without any cost, you can be massively harmful to nations. The third one is about proxy wars. Because let's take God at their best and say that the water wars are still going to happen. I already explained that as a voting block, you need to be as extreme for the people within your block, the people you protect, as you can possibly be. That means you also have to back them up militarily, because otherwise people are simply going to Russia or going to go to the other side. That means that the water wars are happening, now suddenly we call proxy wars between the big powers. That one means they're going to take way longer and more people die, because troops, money, weapons, etc. are going to be... Chance, would you. It also means that you're far more likely to escalate. I'll take OG. Yeah, Tibet and China don't have mutually assured destruction, and your case doesn't engage with Uzbekistan fucking itself. Why then can't nations band against China fucking over countries of a point they fear it happening to them or the US can incentivize this block? Because the point is, the moment Vietnam starts voting against China, they are screwed over because China is going to thread war, it's going to take all the aid, it's going to pull out all the fences, so they hammer the country. Also, I think it's bizarre to claim that Tibet is going to have voting right in this body on the Euro side of the house. I think the fourth and last part of the show is about development. I think this organization is quite unlikely to have an own budget or to have a very least large budget. I already explained why the big nations are going to be most powerful in it. 
The issue is that it means that it directly costs at the management of smaller nations because I don't think big nations are going to care that much about them and because they have so little leverage, etc., in this possibility. That means that Africa, one of the water richest continents on Earth, is unlikely to get irrigation, is unlikely to get more development of the water infrastructure because there's no one willing to invest in it. It also means that Bangladesh is unwilling to actually have the dikes raised given the fact that no one is going to be invested in it. We were the first one to show you what this looked like and show you that the large nations are going to be more powerful. Also gave you four distinct impacts which directly translate into people dying. Trust the Dutch people, water management is different, leave it to nations in itself. Thank you very much for that speech. Uh, now happy to welcome Government Whip here, here. Um, I'm just putting out some papers. While I do so, can I check that I'm audible? Uh, yeah, you are. Cool. Okay, starting in three, two, one. Panel opposition bench in this debate defend a status quo in which the Aral Sea crisis has been ongoing for 60 years. The USSR dissolved several decades ago. These states haven't been come to an agreement that allows them to solve the geopolitical problems of the area. The reason for this, for example, is that Tajikistan has no promise of getting any energy from Kazakhstan, who supplied it during the days of the USSR, and has to therefore use that water to make dams and generate its own hydroelectric power. The political incentives of helping out Kazakhstan for the citizens in Tajikistan are far away. They never overcome those incentives uh, on opposition side of the house, unless we get some kind of ability to overcome these collective action problems. That is to say, any comparative that defends solving the critical problems quickly on their side of the house probably isn't in the debate. What I'm gonna do in this speech then is uh, firstly, a couple of pieces of extraneous rebuttal and then go team by team and explain why it is that CG is beating them. Let's start with extraneous rebuttal. I'd like to talk a little bit about voting blocks here in particular, I think to take the CO case out of the debate. The assertion here is that essentially voting blocks will form within this group and therefore uh, there will be lockups within this. What they don't explain is why the way these voting blocks form is likely one that actually stops regional action from happening. For example, in Central Asia, I think it's likely, given that all of these states are simultaneously allied with Russia, all of them see trade with Europe and America, and all of them see trade with China, it is very likely all major powers have interest in stability and economic prosperity in the region in order to increase trade. I think what that means, for example, is they probably want Kazakhstan to go to arbitration with Tajikistan on their energy and water needs, to the degree that this arbitration is likely because it is a feature of UN bodies in order to allow them for legitimacy. I think what that means is we likely end up getting voting to enter arbitration between these countries and better allocate their needs on our side of the house. The second thing they say, though, then, is that, look, it's that, that this group will be slow to act because they have to call votes uh, and all agree or get 66 percent. Um, look, what I will say here is that it is hard not to act quickly when there is a drought, right? Political pressure internally in all of these countries probably means that in the situations that are most urgent and immediate, aid goes to those countries anyway. Even if that is like NGO or unilateral aid coming from the US, I think that is probably sufficient in cases that are incredibly urgent. I don't think that's what this debate is. This debate is about long-term geopolitical problems, about stability and like resource management in regions. I don't think then this analysis stands in the debate. Um, I think that's everything I want to say about CO that's not going to be dealt with later. Let's then go team by team. I'd like to start by weighing off a bit about uh, with OG because I think it appears that we're vertical on them, even though I don't think we are because they just have no mechanization. What's the OG case? Firstly, they say, ah, people are, this body is likely to be effective essentially because people are likely to join it because we are able to impose sanctions upon them. The only mechanism I would first note that they give for being able to get sanctions at all is contingent on people buying into this organization to want to impose sanctions. Given that they never established that, I don't think they established that sanctions happen. The second thing to say, though, is that sanctions are rare and rarely effective. For example, like re education camps in Xinjiang aren't enough to get global sanctions on China. I have no idea why other behavior would be. Evan gives you four far more plausible mechanisms. Firstly, I think it's just incredibly hard for states to not buy into UN bodies, both because this is a violation of what the UN does, presumably the mechanism by what, which this is established is the UN vote on it. It's very hard for them then to withdraw from the UN or withdraw from UN bodies because that looks awful for those governments internally politically. They are seen as a, con uh, a country internally that doesn't care about peace in international politics or stability. That's awful electorally for uh, these governments. The second though I think is that individual governments stand to gain. Why? Couple of reasons. Firstly, I think they just get protection 
from uh, situations that occur to them in the future when they know that they will need aid and access to this arbitration process. Secondly, for countries like Tajikistan or Kazakhstan, it is the case that access to arbitration courts allows them to individually benefit. The problem in the status quo is it's hard for a politician in Kazakhstan to say that they want to give energy to Tajikistan, harming their own citizens in order to get access to that water, because that's seen as giving up their sovereign power. The, the inverse incentive also happens in Tajikistan. When they're able to enter arbitration courts, though, behind closed doors because the UN is making them, that allows them to better balance their resources without giving up that political power. The third on diplomatic shout, uh, clout, I think Ivan explains well, and is still standing. The fourth on grandstanding, we do get a hit on from CO. I'd like to explain it. They say, look, you just grandstand on the international stage. Yeah, sure, that's the point though, right? At the point where you join the EU, this body, you are in it and you are subject to its rules. To the degree you want to grandstand on the political stage, you are in that body and therefore subject to the rules that it makes. To the degree that you are self-interested and that self-interest implies arbitration, that means we are getting arbitration. I think what that means at the end of the debate is it's actually CG who connects with all of OG's just like head list of impacts about better resource management uh, and better efficacy. What that means then is that we get all of their benefits, we beat them. I think also though, Ivan extends in telling you about why corporate incentives and race to the bottom go away. Even then, if you don't get like the OG's benefits, we connect on separate benefits uh, and therefore take your French. Quickly on OO then. I think OO and largely a negative case where they say, you know, here's reasons why sanctions don't work, people don't want to buy in. Given all the mechanisms I've just explained, I think we beat OO. I'll give them a chance to give a POI though, because they are spamming OO. Unless anyone on GovBench can show an enforcement mechanism that is unique to this motion and overcomes the problems of landlocking, you will not have the capacity to accrue any of your impacts. We showed you why countries need to have bargaining power over their water supply, control of their economies, and ability to avoid external interference. You're trading this off for utopian Yeah, okay, that was 15 seconds. Thanks, thanks, Jack. Okay, I think the mechanisms we give you about self-interest and ability to overcome collective action problems does circumvent these mechanisms that we give you. I will talk about your soft power thing, though. I'd first like to note that this soft power thing concedes that both nations are in this... Uh, thing on our side of the house and therefore it's kind of a self knife to their argument that they won't be. What I will say though is soft power exploitation isn't just about like it's stupid to say that countries are using water as a resource because internal manage uh, to like uh, coerce other countries because internal political incentives mean that those resources have to be used to the benefits of citizens. Citizens won't vote for a government that's using their water just as a way to coerce other countries because they want to be using it for hydroelectric power. That is, Tajikistan, for example, doesn't do this to control Kazakhstan. They do it because they need energy. That doesn't change on their side of the house. I think the point, what this means then is that actually all of these countries' self-interest in terms of waste collection, in terms of energy generation, mean that they likely fuck up countries downstream on their side of the house rather than just using this as a bargaining chip for better allocation. What that means is that their mechanisms of soft power actually fuck up far more countries who are downstream of these water sources than the few ones who are upstream. That is a comparative loss. Look, we get better arbitration, better uh, utile outcomes, more stability on our side of the house. Very proud to stand in government. Thank you very much for that speech. And now let's move on to the last uh, speaker of uh, this debate, the opposition web here, here. Am I audible? Yes. So I think that Gov tries to win this debate by saying that the status quo is really, really bad. I have two issues with the strategy, though. The first thing is that they never really explain why this body would work. But second of all, note that they don't even engage on the analysis that the rule gives to you as to why this body would be actively harmful. I think given that, the Gov bench is already out of this debate. But let me engage with them a little bit more on the following two questions. The first thing is, how will this body actually function and look like? The second of all is then, given this characterization of the international body, what are the effects of this? So let's just start with the big question. How will this body function? I first want to address the idea of who is going to be part of this body. Note that the OO case is largely reliant on the idea that the big powerful countries won't join and therefore the institution will be unenforceable. I think we take it over this characterization given that we say that our analysis works in both scenarios. We explain to you that given the amount of power that water has over countries, it is either one of the two scenarios. 
First of all, superpowers will, mad, uh, will meddle in the international body in order to get their sway and create their own voting blocks, even though they're not in it, though that that's more nuanced than what OO says. But second of all, we actually say that even if Gov is right that the US and Russia and Brazil would want to be part, that is actually something that is actively bad. And I think in that sense, right, we go further than it's not that enforceable. We explain explicit harms. I think based on that, we already take this question. Let's move on to the idea of leverage and who has it. Because note that both, both Gov cases lean on the following characterization. They say Vietnam, for instance, gets screwed over by China. Therefore, it would be really nice if Vietnam could cooperate with another Southeast Asian country or create a voting bloc. Note, though, that they never explain why it's possible for, for Vietnam to go into the voting bloc with other Southeast Asian countries rather than going into a voting bloc with China. We give you three reasons as to why this is unlikely. First of all, the superpowers have more to offer, right? Note that many countries do not care about 90% of the votes within this international body. That means that it's very easy to opt into the idea that China can offer you more at the moment that they can offer you a better trading deal. This institution does not exist within a vacuum. That means that it's far more attractive to go towards China for other benefits rather than saying no to China, actually um, actually risking backlash from China and therefore, for instance, going with a country like Malaysia. But second of all, note that there's competition between these superpowers, right? Given that they're not necessarily in the same boat. That means that these superpowers don't like the idea of A, losing control over these, uh, over these countries, because that means that they can potentially go to the other, but B, that there's a certain morale of loyalty, right? Once you are part of a certain voting block, you need to stay part of that voting block, even if it screws you over as a small country. I don't think that any of the Gov teams ever explain why these countries have this leverage. Then the only CG response that we get is, oh, but you want trade, so you have an incentive to be good. Two things. First of all, if that's true, we wouldn't need this international body, right? Because the, then those, for instance, the West and the US, Russia and China would all have leverage to tell Central Asian countries to work together in order to get their water. So we think in that sense, it is actually, uh, it's actually uncomparative. But second of all, if there's an international body, know that, for instance, the EU and the US would have incentives to act actively screw over the US and Russia, that means that you only make it worse because the Central Asian countries lose agency over themselves. Um, then I want to briefly deal with some small benefits that CG tried to squeal in as a really good response to the OO case, not to our still. The first thing that they say is, oh, but we can have arbitration and there are incentives to do so. Note that they never explain why you only have those incentives within an international body, right? You can still do it outside of that, given that there is international bilateral arbitration. But second of all, even if you're in, in an international body, they never explain why you still need to consent then. So if there's no incentive, you still need to consent to arbitration within the body. They never explain why you wouldn't. The second thing then, then is that they talk about the incentives of politicians to all of a sudden cooperate. Well, I don't know if they've ever seen the UN, right? But none of them seem particularly cooperative in, for instance, the Security Council. The problem is, is that you're always still a representative of your own country. You're always held accountable by your own people. That means that if you all of a sudden start, for instance, giving water to your ally, with uh, to your normal enemy within this international body, you're a pushover. You give water, the most valuable resource to other people instead of your own people. You are a person that doesn't care about your own citizens. I think that means that they're even more likely to be incredibly harsh and that and that it's very easy um, and that you don't actually get collaboration. I don't think the Gov teams prove that. Before I move on to the idea of what are the effects of functioning, I want to take a POI from CG. Sure. So presumably the reason they don't meddle in these countries in the status quo is because that's politically costly and we overcome that. Given then that they all have aligned incentives for stability in the region because these are geopolitically homogenous countries in some sense, they all vote the same way. You never establish why voting blocs vote differently. So first of all, you take away all of the political barriers to create these voting blocs, right? You literally create an institution where the U.S. can literally draw lines within the parliament to vote in a specific way. But second of all, these issues are regional, right? So yes, Africa cares about the votes that are happening within Africa, but they don't give a shit about the votes about Southeast Asia. That means that it's very easy to sway them. I don't think this POI actually responds. Let's move on to functioning. So I first want to deal with the idea of OG about technological exchange. First of all, there's still 
uh, competition between agricultural exporters. That means that there's no incentive to make agriculture more attractive. Second of all, intellectual property exists. You can't just give technology away. I don't think that they ever explained this. Note that we take it over OO, given that we mech in far more detail why countries have incentives to mess each other up and how these political incentives actually translate to behavior in this international body. I want to then deal with the CG idea of racing to the bottom to make pollution very easy. Well, I mean, Shell, for instance, is a Dutch company. Many big multiple multinational corporations are from the West. Note that that means that those big countries where those companies pay taxes have incentives to keep pollution easy. But crucially, they want cheap products. So, so they don't care about solving pollution in a different country, right? Who crucially explains to you the following things? In the status quo, there's a deterrent to screw each other over in water management, because otherwise you get water wars between two countries. The problem with an international body is that there's no deterrent anymore, because you would have to wage war against the whole body. Therefore, you get screwing over in water management, but you're more likely to get proxy wars as you need to radicalize the various trading blocks. But crucially, we say that voting goes too slow, right? There is a problem because you lose agency over your water management, and therefore the international body is too slow to fix issues and too lazy and ignorant to build infrastructure in poorer countries for all of these reasons, please vote CO.